dun 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 deck tech the video where we talk about my commander my deck and the cards i enjoy drawing leah here filming another deck tech we've got admiral beckett brass is the commander of my tribal pirates deck i pick this as the pirate commander out of all the others because the first time i built the pirate deck i actually built it out of the Ixalan box. I called it a box sealed where I just opened all 36 packs, picked a legendary creature, and built a deck around the legendary creature based on all the cards I found in the entirety of the box. It was kind of a fun experiment and it actually worked really good because Ixalan is very tribal focused so I could open quite a few pirates out of that box. This version of the deck tech is a significantly upgraded version of that pirate deck since it was... I didn't keep the original list, so I found a new list for the pirate deck that I just stole off of EDH Rec, and then they have optimized the pirate deck to be more efficient. I unoptimized it to be more piratey and a little closer to the original of what I would have built. So we're going to jump on into looking at a semi-optimized, mostly piratey list and some stats for that. And then we'll get to my favorite cards in it. Probably going to be one of my shorter deck techs, but here we go. Taking a look at the pirate deck, the first thing I'll point out is that the land base in the pirate deck is as optimized as I could possibly make it. Some Cavern of Souls, I have the, uh, these are the Battle Bond lands. We've got some Fetch lands in here, Shock lands in here, original Dual lands hanging out in here. I, there, there's no financial limit on what I wanted for the mana base. The original build of the deck was this way as well to compensate for the fact that the rest of the deck was only cards I could open out of an, one Ixalan box. So I thought I would carry that forward into the newer build of the deck and just no limits on the mana. It Everything I had. The one real important card to point out in the mana base is Rogue's Passage, which now I don't see. Oh, there it is. It's over here. Rogue's Passage. So, Admiral Beckett Brass wants to steal your opponent's stuff when you manage to attack with three or more pirates in the turn. So there are 35, 34 or 35 pirates in the whole deck, and the uh, first mates pirates here are all of the main attackers. You want to find a few of these in the deck because they have cannot be blocked frequently in some fashion as part of their abilities. So then when Admiral Beckett Brass is on the field, you want to at least have a few of these to swing with so you can trigger her ability. Since the primary function of the deck is to do combat, you want to have some combat finishers. If you're going to be hitting your opponent and stealing their stuff, you might as well also be able to sink their ship. So Shared Animosity and Marcadia's Downfall are the two combat finishers of the deck. And the other thing that would happen when you're in a combat situation is you need your Quartermaster to make sure you're well equipped. So our Quartermaster cards all give our pirates bonuses of plus one, plus one, plus one, plus O, oh, plus two, plus O, oh, anything to help greatly increase that combat damage. A few alternate finishers in the deck, I always like to have a backup plan, is Revel and Riches. It makes a lot of sense because pirates want to get treasure anyways. That's the basic gist of the deck. Everything else, we've got a lot of some of the 
a lot of cool pirates have come out since Ixalan. So we can have a lot of fun pirate options to try out in here, including some new legendary pirates who could very well have their own deck someday, but it was kind of fun to be able to put them all together in this deck. Our artifact package is fairly basic. Some mana rocks, some card ramp, these two cards. Some basic control. We want to be able to counter stuff. We want to be able to wipe out armies of small creatures. Occasionally we have to get enchantments off the board because these are not the most amazing colors for dealing with enchantments. So at least one board wipe in the deck. A little more card draw. A little more direct control. Just, just enough to make the deck run without losing the strong pirate flavor. But other than that, fairly basic tribal pirate deck, and we'll look at the stats. And a quick look at the stats as a very average mana curve. It used to be a little lower in the CMC before I unoptimized it, but I do like that it covers a full range of mana costing spells so that I've got a few big things to cast. Other than that, it's very standard tribal being mostly creatures. Nothing particularly exciting. So looking at the favorite cards of this deck, we're going to start off with Underground Sea. I always like to have an excuse to play my Underground Seas or my other dual lands, but I don't play them often because I understand that they are not affordable in today's world of magic. They used to be considerably more affordable than they were today, but it's really hard to say that they've ever actually been affordable to the demand. They've always gone up with the demand. I think that's fairly unfortunate because I'd like more people to be able to play, and when those people want to play, they also want to use the good and desirable cards like everybody else. They don't want to be stuck with Guild gates and stuff is their lands. When I originally got these, I think they were just $80, which is still very high, admittedly. But I don't think I want to get rid of them. I know if I get rid of them, I'm probably never going to be able to acquire them again. But I don't see a point in keeping them either if I'm never going to use them. So I do use them. Next card we have is this nice foily onslaught island. The foiling on these is pretty good. I get a lot of shine off of it, and they have this cool little star on the cards as well. That uh, told you you had a premium card, but you could see that you had a premium card because it had a nice shine to it. So this island also looks like a place where pirates would go. If I was a pirate, I'd go there. A lot of the island choices in this deck reflect, if I was a pirate, I would go there. So Chaos Warp, this particular printing is the 2012 Commander's Arsenal printing. And the Commander's Arsenal was severely underprinted. There just weren't a lot of them. I don't know what the demand was for it. In 2012, when it came out, I'd never heard of it. I wasn't really playing Commander in 2012. I had a deck from the 2011 pre-cons, but that was, the, that was the only product I had. But into later in the 2000, like 2015 or 2016, I did have a contract job with Wizards of the Coast. And this job entailed one or two weekends a year. I would go to a very large convention and volunteer with whatever they needed volunteers for. So you'd set up the show, you'd move all the product, and you could end up rolling posters for eight hours and rubber banding them just so that they could be handed out the next day. You'd sort packs and run papers around and 
teach people magic or teach people Dungeons and Dragons or when I started I hadn't worked my way up the ladder severely yet so I taught Star Wars miniatures that was the game they had going and I want to say Harvest Moon I'm pretty sure it's a video game it was something with little chibi anime characters and pigs and it was an odd game but I knew the rules so I could teach it and when you go to a big convention most people who are in the booth were volunteers in those kinds of positions they would spend their time teaching the game to others for whichever company they had contracted that volunteer time for and they're often paid in product Sometimes the negotiation involves a hotel room, but sometimes they're showing up on their own dime because it's something they really enjoy doing. Now, working in a booth is really fun. It is a completely different way to experience the convention. Everybody should, everybody with decent social skills should probably give it a try at some point. But this uh, commander's... 2012 Arsenal was part of the payment for working that year and I still didn't know what it was when I got it. I just thought I got some cool shiny cards for at home, opened it up. I think it was a year before I figured out how much that was worth, but I still like playing my uh, Chaos Warp. We have another island here, which just has some amazing color to it. The foiling is pretty good on this one. I like the color. It shows up pretty good on camera. Even this nice bluish green color here. All right, one more card with a long story. Maybe two more. So this soul ring was in the first pack of Commander's Legends Collector booster that I opened. I was pretty excited to get it. I had traded a lot of uh, product into my LGS to get the store credit to buy two boxes of Commander's Legends. So that's, I don't know, $800? It was a lot of product. So I got my two boxes of Commander's Legends and everything has curled. This soul ring within about a week was so curly I was very concerned about putting it in a deck that also had an underground sea. I didn't want my underground sea to be that curly. I really like my cards flat. I also really like my cards shiny and borderless and premium feeling and unique. That's why this section of each of my deck techs even exists because there's no other way online to show off uniqueness or personality in building an EDH deck. That's a big part for a lot of people building an EDH deck is to show off some emotional attachment to magic. So there's usually a few cards in every deck that have that theme for me. Now this soul ring has that attachment to it. It's the first sweet looking soul ring I opened out of the first pack. But I definitely question some of the direction of quality printing. If, if I can't play the cards, then there can't be a game that, that will kill the game if you can't play the cards. That, that's it. They need to be playable quality or else they're not worth anything. So do I think I got $800 worth of product? Probably not. A lot of it's in pretty bad shape. I've done my best, but it was pretty bad. I'll go back to some good news. With Biden to Thassa, I picked this for one of my show cards because I've always liked them putting the uh, date on the pre-release cards, this is the 27th of September on this one, but sometimes I think people can get lucky and the date on the card could be their birthday. I've got a Teferi Master of Time with my birthday weekend pre-release stamp on it that I think is pretty cool. Okay. This is a uh, 
This is a pair of cards. Well, I can get that to be on camera. There. So this pair of cards, Malcolm and Breaches, is one of my highlights of the deck because I thought the Ixalan storyline itself was really great. I enjoyed the adventures of the belligerent. I enjoyed the character development between Jason and Veroska. I enjoyed the supporting cast that came with that. There was a lot of that that was just extremely good writing. It was fun. It was easy to read. Someday I would like to make a pirate deck that is the adventures of the belligerent and maybe that I haven't picked a time for that yet. Is it before Varashka arrived? Is it before Jace arrived? Is it when they're both on the belligerent? I don't know. Varashka's color identity having green in it clashes pretty hard with the color identity of just every other pirate card out there, so I think it'll be interesting to build. Maybe someday they'll actually give me the belligerent as a card. That would be great, too. That's, that's all my favorite cards from this deck.